I believe they sacrificed a girl and killed another one. Well, have you heard about the guy that state police in Indiana think murdered two young girls near the Monon High Bridge in a little place called Delphi? You know, we used to speak of the horrific murders of Abigail Williams and Liberty German. You know, the victims. But not anymore. Defense attorneys and conspiracy theorists have pushed the victims aside. And now all we talk about are the mysteries, not the facts that have come out. So stick around if you'd like to hear my 10 reasons why I believe Richard Allen might get convicted. Well, hello, everybody, and welcome to Profiling Evil. I hope you'll take a moment, hit that like and subscribe button, and share us with all your friends. Make sure you're also checking out our website, profilingevil.com. Now, I, like you, listened intently to an exclusive interview with one of Richard Allen's former attorneys. It was conducted by Court TV's Barbara McDonald, and I, and I thought it was just an excellent interview. The lawyer seemed incredibly sincere and, frankly, likable. He's the kind of guy that I'd like defending me if I was ever in trouble. He convincingly argued that he believes Richard Allen is innocent and that he's being framed and that a group of crazed Odinists are out there sacrificing children. Well, let's look quickly at the first five reasons that I think Delphi Evidence is going to convict Richard Allen. Hmm. Number one. Richard Allen acknowledged to police that he was, in fact, on the Monon High Bridge Trail on the day of the murders. Number two, he told investigators that he was wearing jeans and a blue or maybe black car hat jacket. Same day on the day that he walked the Monon High Bridge and he saw the girls. Allen's wife also confirmed that he owned a blue Cardiff jacket, and I believe it was recovered when the search warrant was served. Number three, a vehicle resembling Allen's 2016 Ford Focus was observed near the trail on the same day the murders occurred. Now, that places him there. Number four, in an October 13, 2022 interview, Allen admitted again that he saw Abby and Libby on the trails east of the Freedom Bridge. And number five, right off the bat, witnesses reported seeing a man who resembled Allen in muddy and bloody clothing on the Monon High Bridge Trail. Hey, and since I'm fired up, let me just add the sixth one. On the victim's phone, that mobile phone that captured images of the bridge guy, one of the victims reportedly mentions the word gun as the man approaches. Now, these are all confirmed facts that have come out during the investigation or revealed uh, either through the arrest affidavit or statements made by police or other people in a position of authority. But it doesn't end there. Police also released information about the crime scenes, revealing that there were multiple crime scenes in this case. For instance, we can now theorize with some confidence that the initial contact site was near the bridge when the video was captured with the suspect, the bridge guy, and the victim's realization that the person had a weapon. That's going to be up to you to decide if you believe that that's really what was said on the video or not. Now, there are many true crime junkies out there who say one person couldn't have controlled both girls in this crime scene. I just disagree. I've seen evidence in too many cases where that is exactly what happened. I mean, imagine the debilitating fear that the girls might have experienced when they were facing a calm man who, again, was very calm and deliberate in his commands, a commanding person. But not only that, he was pointing a firearm at them. Predators count on our goodness in these kinds of situations, knowing that most of us wouldn't intentionally hurt another human being. In fact, what happens is we vicariously place our own value system on the predator, thinking, hey, I wouldn't hurt anyone, so maybe this guy isn't going to hurt me. Now, predators, on the other hand, will use guile 
to convince their victims to become more compliant. We end up complying because we hope it will mitigate the predator's anger and get them on their way, including we at times are willing to allow a predator to control us, perhaps tie us up or anything else, just in hopes that they will in fact go away. But once the predator has control emotionally and physically, they can do whatever they want for as long as they want, or at least as long as they feel safe. I was asked by Vinnie Politan about this list of evidence in the case, and our discussion kind of moved toward the unspent bullet that was recovered at the murder scene next to the victims. Now, Vinnie goes through some of these points that I've talked about, but there was a lot of back and forth about the value of that ballistic comparison. Just keep this in mind, folks. I know there are arguments on both sides. If that was the only piece of evidence piling up against Richard Allen, I might agree with you that it's pretty shaky. But when we look at the totality of the evidence that's being stacked in the state's favor, I think it's pretty darn convincing. And that brings me to number seven on my list of reasons of why Richard Allen might be found guilty of the murders of Abby and Libby. And to do that, talking about the bullet, let's watch that discussion on Court TV last night. All right, we're going to bring in some more guests to join uh, me and Barbara here. Joining us in Orange County, California, the author of Forest for the Trees, a book about the Delphi murders, investigative producer Chris Todd. And in Salt Lake City, Utah, retired police commander, religious cult expert, host of the Profiling Evil podcast, and the author of the book Deceived, an investigation into Zion society cult, Mike King is here. Um... All right, Mike King, um, here's the evidence, right? Because he's arrested because they believe they have evidence in the case. It's not like, oh, it's just, hey, he's at CVS, let's get that guy. Richard Allen told police he was on the trail the day Abby and Libby went missing. Richard Allen's description of the clothing he was wearing that day matches the clothing of the suspect in the video on the victim's phone. A vehicle resembling Allen's 2016 Ford Focus was observed near the trail around 1.30. And the Indiana State Police Lab determined an unspent round found near the victim's bodies had been cycled through Richard Allen's Sig Sauer model P226, which apparently he kept for all those years, uh, according to prosecutors. Your thoughts about the strength of that case based on that evidence? Take into account, how can all these things happen? And we've talked about circumstantial evidence in these kinds of cases before. And I don't know whether Richard Allen's responsible for this or not, but I do know that you just named five things that are incredibly coincidental that he would happen to be in the same place at the same time. And when we get and when we get to see the ballistics on this unspent round that was cycled through, I don't know if that means that it's a, an artifact of scraping on the sides of the, the cartridge itself that is the artifact, if there was an actual attempt to fire that bullet and there's indentations on the firing pin, but it was a misfire, it's gonna be really important when that thing comes into court and there are both sides shouting out at the top of their lungs that that, is, uh, that, that, that kind of a comparison is of no value and others saying it absolutely is. But if you've got markings that that gun is the only gun on the earth that will make and those end up on those cartridges, that are found next to the bodies. That's incredibly powerful evidence. Now, I wanna put this up on the screen because there is one other piece of evidence I think is something that needs to be explained. On April 3rd, 2023, Richard Allen made a phone call to his wife, Kathy Allen. And this is while he's locked up. In that phone call, Richard Allen admits several times that he killed Abby and Libby. Investigators had the phone call transcribed and the transcription confirms that Richard Allen admits that he committed the murders of Abigail Williams and Liberty German. He admits several times within the phone call that he committed the offenses as charged. His wife, Kathy Allen, ends the phone call abruptly. Barbara McDonald, what did William uh, Labrado have to say about that? 
Uh, he said he has a lot of questions about it, that his understanding is it was basically one sentence that Richard spoke, this confession, so not a lot of detail provided in that confession. And he says that Richard Allen was receiving medication while he's in prison, uh, both shots and pills. He doesn't know what those medications were. He tried to find out. And uh, so he has a lot of questions about what all was going on. He also says false confessions are a real thing, especially when people are subjected to very uh, harsh prison conditions. Yeah, the one thing about the false confession in this case, though, that I, I've, we've seen him here on court TV, but it's usually under an interrogation scenario. This is a, a call to his wife. Um, Mike King, your thoughts on that? Um, because this is going to be significant. No one has heard this thing outside of investigators, and I, I presume maybe at some point the defense will hear it. Um, what are your thoughts about this, this confession, and what would be important about the circumstances for you surrounding it? I think that the most important thing that comes out of this is it wasn't one confession. By every account that I've read and other testimony I've heard on, on different media sources is that it was at least five times, maybe six times, that he made these confessions or admissions that he was the guy. And I think that's going to be really difficult to overcome, Vinny. You can say, okay, he might have been having a problem just before he started eating evidence and having all of this bizarre behavior. So I want to know the timing of those other four or five calls, not only just to his wife, but we also know that one of those calls was to his mother, uh, where he explained that he was the guy. So here are a couple of things that I believe are going to come out and be accepted by the court. Number one, that the bullet recovered next to the victims ballistically matches the 40 caliber Sig Sauer handgun that was recovered in that search warrant at Richard Allen's home. Now, what hasn't been shared are the identifiable ballistics on that bullet and frankly, and on the gun. I mean, are they scrapes and scratches on the sides of the casings? Are there artifacts from the base of the casing? Or is there a firing pin strike suggesting that there might have been a misfire? Did police recover any kind of DNA from the unspent cartridge? And keep in mind what I consider to be the eighth reason why Richard Allen might be found guilty of these murders when Allen was questioned about that unspent round that was found near the victim's bodies, and remember, this is an unspent bullet that, according to the state, forensically matched Allen's 40 caliber uh, Sig Sauer handgun. Allen didn't have an explanation for how that bullet ended up there. But he did say that he hadn't loaned the weapon out to anyone, that he hadn't allowed anyone to use the weapon, and he confirmed his tie to the bullet that was found at the crime scene and that tie to his, his weapon that was recovered in his home. Most importantly, what it tells me is that according to Richard Allen, he's the only one that would have had access to that weapon. Now, I think this is huge and people can argue all day long the value of comparative ballistics from an unspent or an unfired round. But common sense suggests to me that if the state of Indiana can prove to that jury that Richard Allen's weapon is the only gun on earth that could create those scrapes, those artifacts, those imperfections on the bullet casing when it's cycled through the weapon, they have an incredibly powerful piece of evidence. And that piece of evidence could place Richard Allen... And we know it does place his weapon at the crime scene. Whether it was separated and dropped there like the conspiracy theorists believe, or whether it somehow was cycled out of the weapon in the course of this frenzied assault on the girls. Again, it can be argued all day long that this unspent bullet may have been cycled through Allen's weapon and then strategically placed at the scene by Odinists, who are attempting to frame Allen. Possible, but is it probable to you? Especially when we compare it and join it 
with this growing list of circumstantial evidence in the case. And there is circumstantial evidence. There are admissions, and we're going to talk about those in a minute. There are eyewitness accounts that place him at the scene and confessions that he was at the scene. Well, as my conversation continued on court TV, the topic of those jailhouse confessions by Richard Allen came to the forefront. And, you know, Barbara McDonald, in her interview with Allen's previous attorney, revealed that the defense is going to argue that Allen's confession was compelled and that he did it out of fear from these Odinist guards or other conspirators in the community. And that brings me to reason number nine. So let's listen to that exchange for a moment. You had not heard of Odinism when it first was floated with regard to this case? I honestly thought, I was like, no disrespect to Mr. Baldwin and Mr. Rosie, because they're, they're excellent lawyers. I thought it was hocus pocus. I, I honestly didn't, I, I'd never heard of it. Um, and the more I got into it, um, that's, that's a real thing. It is a real thing, and it's scary. In what way? Well, I believe they sacrificed a girl and killed another one. Now, Mike King, I want to put this back up on the screen, because when, when you and I first heard about this, we were, we were skeptical. And then the state had to respond to the allegation made by the defense, and they said that Sergeant Redacted and Sergeant Redacted have worn patches that refer to Odinism. These are the people watching Richard Allen. Those patches reflect the sergeant's religious beliefs and are not associated with any kind of cult. Sergeant Redacted did not remove the patches from his vest until ordered to do so by command. And then apparently got the tattoo. All right, so Mike King, where do you see the line between religion and cult? Because I think that's significant here. Because if, if someone's practicing their religion, they're practicing their religion. They might believe something different than, than we do or something different than their neighbor believes. Everyone's entitled to yeah. practice whatever religion they want. But if you're getting into the world, world of cult, that raises a red flag and to me raises a, a, a greater possibility of something bizarre like a, a, a ritualistic sacrifice. But first you've got to cross the line into it being a cult. So how do you see that issue? You know, I, as Barbara interviewed, I thought it was so interesting that, that the message that came across is every Odinist is committing murderers out there, which we've had guests on the show with us here, Vinny, that you've brought in that are followers of this Odinist ideology, and they absolutely repel that idea and say, no, it, it's, it's a very uh, peaceful kind of a group of people. Every cult I've ever looked at boils down to whether it is coercive in nature or not. And um, and so when you think about re mainstream religion and the openness of mainstream religion, sometimes we could argue they're closed in mainstream religion. And then you look at cults, there, there are cults that uh, probably are not very uh, harmful, like the cults of people that, that follow the Dallas Cowboys. But then when you get into the ideology that's coercive and there's coercive mind control and there is all kinds of conspiracy attached to it, that's the kind of cult that we really worry about and that we, we think about when we look at cases like this. So what we have to do is we have to separate the two first and foremost and figure out if it's coercive. In my experience, after looking at hundreds and hundreds of ritual crime allegations, was that there are predators who will use religion to be a power guys, to control a victim, to get them to believe that if they don't remain quiet, something will happen mysteriously, mystically, or religiously. And it's a way to control their victim and continue to be a predator. But I go back to this idea that if this happened, and if it was a group of Odinists, that is one magnificent conspiracy to put all of this together it is one magnificent conspiracy to get all these people that had to have been involved, that were out burning things in the woods and putting sticks on people, to get them all to remain quiet. And I guess that's the problem I have, Vinny, from an investigative standpoint. I mean, this is really compelling. On April 3rd, 2023, 
Richard Allen was on a jailhouse phone speaking to his wife, and he told her that he killed Abigail Williams in Liberty German. Now, police confirmed this by reviewing the transcripts of the call, and they confirmed that he admitted that not just once, but several times, stating that he committed the murders. In fact, it got so bad at one point that his wife just hung up on him, terminating the call. In all, reports suggest that Allen has admitted that he murdered the girls at least five times while talking to either his wife or his mother on those jailhouse monitored phones. Now, our conversation on Court TV evolved at that point into cult behaviors and cult leadership dynamics. So let's catch those comments as we try to wrap our heads around how difficult it would be to have multiple people involved in a major conspiracy without losing control of the secrecy required to get away with double murder. Let me follow up really quickly on, on this. For it to be a cult, does there have to be like a leader or a, like leaders that are coercing the masses to do these things? In, in most cults, you're gonna see one person that all people look to or maybe one or two that all look to, and they are the final rule. They are the one that makes the decision. And we, we saw this in cases that I investigated where you have the leader who comes up with these spiritually wacky ideas, but then you have the followers who wanna be the arm of the leader and go out and act it out. But in those kinds of circumstances, Vinny, there are too many tongues that know about what happened, and I just don't believe it remains as quiet as this has remained. All right, so let me ask Barbara McDonald here on set with me. Barbara, is, is there any indication at this point with this allegation of this Odinistic society or group or whatever that there's a leader? Not that I've heard of. I mean, there were some names that were uh, listed in one of the filings from Bradley Rosie and Andrew Baldwin, um, but... But not like a, a hierarchy, like, okay, this is, this is the man or woman that, we, that is sort of leading our group and is saying, hey, it's time for a sacrifice or something like that. Yeah, I think there, there probably is somebody filling that role, but that hasn't really been clearly defined. And, and how serious is this group, if this is in fact a group? Um, are they people sort of playing this on weekends or is this something they're taking very seriously? We also spent a little time talking about the alleged mistreatment of Richard Allen by corrections officials and, frankly, the court system. We're seeing the defense continue to argue that Richard Allen is being horribly mistreated. And then we see responses that come back from the state suggesting that he's being treated better than other inmates in the system. I don't know it's true, but if this is true... It's really alarming that there is such a polar difference between the defense and the prosecution in regard to his treatment. And it's inciting so many concerns about Richard Allen's treatment. We don't talk about Abby and Libby anymore. In most circumstances, defendants who are awaiting trial are usually confined in a county jail, not a prison, at least in my experience. But we don't know all the facts or the reasons why the state has taken these measures. We don't know whether Richard Allen's behaviors are threatening, whether he's a suicide threat, uh, or whether he's dangerous to other people. I mean, he certainly looks more frail and seems less threatening than other inmates that I've seen in my career. But we just don't know. And I believe the defense is going to continue to force the dialogue to be about those kinds of things, his treatment, the, the conditions he's in, the bad judge. They're going to focus on everything else except for the evidence in this case. Evidence that suggests Allen is responsible for the murders of Abigail Williams and Liberty German. Let's catch that conversation around this particular issue on Court TV. Mike King, this is very un unusual. I mean, this is, what are, what are your thoughts about transferring from a county facility to a state prison, number one, and then, you know, the way he's handcuffed and, and all the concerns, I guess, that the, the correctional facilities have for this pretrial detainee? 
I, I guess two things, Vinny, based on my experience. And, and the first is that uh, I've seen inmates be moved from a county jail to a larger facility because of resources, the ability to have a better way of caring for them. When, when, when I hear this, I'm just shaking my head and wondering what on earth is so necessary in the control mechanisms that are going on. But I don't know what his behavior is otherwise. And they may have all kinds of documented reasons behind why they're having to do and take the course of action that they're taking. I also reflect on inmates that I've talked to over the years. And I've been in prison a lot of times, eating a lot of prison lasagna with killers. And uh, I've heard them say, doing time in a county jail is a whole lot worse than doing it in a prison. And finally, I'd say uh, I conducted a study for the Bureau of Justice where I interviewed serial killers across the United States. Every time I went in, I was able to be face to face with them, but I was law enforcement at the time. They might have their feet shackled to the floor. They might even have a chain and they're shackled, but they can at least move their hands up and down and there's limited mobility. What we're seeing here on the images, Vinny, is just odd to me that they even allowed that to happen. And I have to agree with the attorneys. How on earth could you do your job? Yeah, you have to, you're preparing for a trial. And I mean, I, I get it. They believe they have very strong evidence, um, but he's still just presumed innocent under our... Now, I want to make it very clear. There's no question in my mind, though, that interviewing Richard Allen in these kinds of confined conditions would be difficult at best, if not nearly impossible. The criminal justice system has to allow attorneys the ability to meet with their clients and for the client to participate in their own defense and the preparation of their case. This could result in some major appeals in the Richard Allen case if he's in fact convicted. And this leaves me with the tenth reason why Richard Allen might be found guilty of murdering Abby and Libby. Now, I'm not sure how I missed this initially, but it's been reported that police also recovered another 40 caliber unspent bullet that had been cycled through Richard Allen's Sig Sauer handgun. That, that to me was remarkable that they did. The thing that makes this so intriguing to me is the place where that bullet was found. You see, the report suggests that it was found in a keepsake box. And that keepsake box was held in Richard Allen's bedroom. So my question is, why was this bullet so important that you'd store it in a keepsake container? Is it a reminder of the crime scene? You know, a, a trophy of sorts? Was it a simple oversight as he was emptying his pockets and he thought, I'll just throw the bullet in here until I have time to put it with all of my other ammunition? I don't know. But it leaves me hoping that we're going to get the answer during the trial to that question. Because in that trial... We're going to also learn how Abby and Libby died, and this is all part of number 10. Police are indicating that the girls suffered sharp object wounds. What else is this autopsy going to tell us? Is it going to say that they died by a sharp object? Did they die by a gunshot wound? Was there blunt force trauma or evidence of strangulation? The autopsy is going to be critical in helping us hypothesize what really happened, instead of just speculating recklessly. So there you go, folks. These are my top 10 reasons why I think Richard Allen might get convicted of murdering Abigail Williams and Liberty German in Delphi, Indiana. Each of these points is undoubtedly going to be argued by the defense, and perhaps many of you will have to see how the chips fall on this one, but I'd like to know what your thoughts are. And frankly, as long as the defense successfully refocuses our attention on Richard Allen's treatment by the correctional facilities or the actions of a judge who may have made poor decisions, we're not going to be focusing on the elements of this murder and on the facts of this case, the kind of facts that must be proven in order to convict Richard Allen of murder. And not to be outdone, as long as the defense and all the conspiracy theorists out there successfully refocus our attention on Odinists 
or groups of killers and cult behaviors, we're not going to be focusing on the facts of this case and the elements of murder, the kind of facts that have to be proven in order to convict Richard Allen of murder. I'd like to know what your thoughts are on this one, and I hope you'll put them down below. And make sure you're hitting that like and subscribe button and join the Profiling Evil family. And remember, you can find Profiling Evil on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and here on YouTube. And don't forget to sign up for our digital newsletter, the BOLO. BOLO stands for Be On The Lookout. The only way you're going to get the BOLO, folks, is to go to ProfilingEvil.com and sign up for the BOLO. Hey, make sure you're sharing Profiling Evil with your friends and contacts. And don't forget to catch Profiling Evil podcasts in audio form on your favorite podcast platform. Hey, folks, we'll see you soon at the next crime scene.